It's Thursday, which means it's, it's hot news, and it means I have an existential question of the day for you, which is, what is the average number of arms that a person has? It blew my mind to realize that the obvious answer isn't the actual answer. And I don't have the specific number. I'm sure a lot of you are gonna Google it. Friends, how many arms does the average person have? Or no, you can't ask how many arms does the average person has, because the average person has two. But what's the average number of arms a person has? Mariah Crawford was right. I took her serum too soon. Even that makes me think of like Goro from Mortal Kombat, where he has like four. Anyways, with that being said, what's the average number of years it takes Intel to catch up to its competition? Oh. Well, according to them, yeah. Ooh, wicked burn. According to Intel, it's gonna be at least two from where we are right now. If you take that from where they should have been, it's probably like on average about six right now because Intel CFO held a press conference yesterday with Morgan Stanley talking about everything that's going on with Intel. And he said that undoubtedly they are currently in the 10 nanometer era for Intel, which makes me ask where are my 10 nanometer chips? But regardless of that, they also said that it's probably not going to be the best node that Intel has ever had. It's going to be less productive than 14 nanometers and less Less productive than 22 nanometers. The fact is, like I said, it isn't going to be as strong as Node as people would expect from 14 nanometers or what they'll see in seven nanometers. And then on top of that, not only saying, hey, don't expect much from us, but also saying that they probably won't be in full force and shifting over to seven nanometers until the end of 2021. So we have two more full years of enduring Intel not being competitive with AMD. Now, obviously this isn't to say that Intel isn't in the 10 nanometer area. They obviously have some ice like CPUs going out and they have some networking cards shipping with 10 nanometers. But as far as their CPUs, their processors in desktops, in high end computing, their Xeons, all of that is still currently 14 nanometers with no specific roadmap on when they're going to be jumping over to 10. But, you know, we're firmly in the 10 nanometer era. And then he also added, so we bring a lot of capability to the table for our customers in addition to the CPU. And we feel like we're starting to see the acceleration on the process side that we've been talking about to get back to pair in the seven nanometer generation and regain leadership in the five nanometer generation. So they don't expect them being on par until the end of 2021. And then to actually get ahead of AMD is gonna be even further, which obviously they're presuming that AMD is not gonna come up with some wicked innovation and they're just gonna still be on the Zen architecture, which Intel will know how to deal with, which is possible. It's not necessarily something that wouldn't happen or they're betting big on the fact that they are better than AMD because they are worth so much more money and they should have never had this issue in the first place and they fired the CEO who is responsible, not for this, but for sleeping with one of his employees. But that's a whole nother story. We talked about that in an episode long ago. Yeah, that, that was many moons ago, my friends. But speaking of AMD, let's talk about their GPU side of things because it's supposed that they're gonna be talking about the RDNA 2 architecture today at their Financial Analyst Day webinar, which is happening at 4 p.m. Eastern time, which we're actually gonna be doing a live stream of here at UFT Tech, so you can tune in for that. However, this is based on like a Reddit post that makes it kind of suspect that they're going to talk about it. But the reason it's so heavily hinted at is the fact that both Microsoft and Sony are talking about their stuff when AMD has been mum on the whole issue. So now's as good a time as ever to actually discuss the thing that literally everybody else already knows about. So tune in for that financial analyst day here for AMD. We're going to be live streaming it regardless and we'll find out if it's indeed true if we're going to get some RDNA 2 information coming out. What also came out yesterday was that AMD has the contract for the Department of Energy's El Capitan 2 exaflop supercomputer, and that it's gonna be using Zen 4 CPUs based on the five nanometer architecture, next generation Radeon Instinct GPUs, and the next generation architecture that the CPUs are gonna be based on is called Genoa, which reminds me of both Genos from One Punch Man and then Sephiroth's Mama. Hopefully that computer brings both to life. In case you're not familiar, two exaflops is a heckin' lot. That's more than petaflops. And currently our GPUs are sitting at teraflops, which a thousand more than that is a petaflop, and then a thousand more than that is an exaflop, and then you double that, and that's how you have two exaflops in this giant beastly computer. Crazy. And then let's go ahead and talk about one last little bit of AMD stuff, which is that apparently there's some not really great substantiated rumors coming out that the PlayStation 5 base model that we've been talking about, the nine teraflop one that's expected is just that a base model and that there will be a simultaneous pro launch of the PS5 Pro, which will beat or match
launch the Xbox Series X because the Series X is supposed to be Microsoft's top of the line coming in at 12 teraflops. And so getting a 12 teraflop or 13 teraflop PS5 Pro could potentially make it so that Sony is on parity, but then obviously that's going to be ridiculously expensive. We'll wait and see if this rumor has any substantiation whatsoever, but currently it is flowing out there. I just wanted to bring it to y'all's attention. Now let's talk about something that's probably gonna be a little bit more expensive than a PlayStation 5, and that's a Tesla Model 3. Cause Tesla has announced what is known as the track package for the Model 3. It's $5,500 to upgrade from your performance model Model 3 and get a brake line fluid replacement, new wheels, new lug nut covers, new tire pressure centers, uh, new brake pads, everything is just redone so that you're actually better on the track with this new track package. It's supposed to bring you the best race and times, $5,500 over on Tesla's website, but sorry if you do not have the performance model, this upgrade is not available for you. So any of you have dual motor long range, suck it. And then a little bit more news about Tesla, thanks to Voldemort and some supply chain disruptions that's happening. Obviously in China with how everything's produced, the Model 3s that are currently being rolled out in China are actually a little bit behind on their autopilot hardware. Tesla's had to downgrade them from the autopilot hardware level 3 to the 2.5, and by level I mean model or at hardware 2.5. The 2.5 hardware chip isn't fully capable of full self-driving, but Tesla has promised everybody who's bought a Model 3 in recent years that's on 2.5 can upgrade to the hardware 3.0 for free, and that's still going to apply for the Chinese models that are currently shipping out with 2.5. It'll just have to be a later upgrade that happens with retrofitting, and it's the same for anybody in the US who has a Model 3 with 2.5, you get upgraded to three, but currently, as far as I know, all Model 3s currently being sold in the US is on the hardware 3.0. But then let's talk about Tesla's competition from GM because they've announced a new battery platform known as Ultium, which is supposedly going to bring in a whole lot of flexibility to their supply chain and make it so that they can bring the cost down on their batteries to be under $100 per kilowatt hour, which means that they would be very compatible, compatible. Com competitional. This would obviously mean that they are able to keep up with price and potentially beat Tesla in the head-to-head -head combat of the new electric Hummer and the Cybertruck. We'll see if that actually happens. Then Ford's also getting in more on the electric vehicle train. We've already seen the Mustang EV that's been out and now they've announced that the Ford Transit van is going electric and coming to America. This is something that I saw a lot of in my time in South Africa, basically like a Dodge Sprinter essentially, and that's gonna be coming to the US in electric form. And Apple's gonna be bringing their MacBook Pro to a 14 inch form, potentially according to rumors out there. And the screen is gonna be based on mini LED technology, which is great because it gives you a lot of contrast, makes it close to OLED without burn-in like OLED susceptible to. Mini LED could be good, obviously. If they keep the hardware the same as what they have in the 16 inch, then the 14 inch is gonna be a great buy, but it would also be very, very difficult for them to thermal dissipate all of that power that's coming out of there. And the 16 inch already struggles with it, so I'm not sure if they're gonna do that. But a 14 inch MacBook with an i9 and that RX 5500M, I would love that. And then more Apple news, there's an analyst out there predicting the reason why you shouldn't sell Apple stock right now is because we're in a super cycle for iPhones. An iPhone super cycle apparently is when hundreds of millions of people are due for an upgrade on their iPhones and then there's a new one coming out. So apparently nobody's in a super cycle right now with the 11th gen because everybody had recently upgraded to the 10 models or the 10R, but with the 12 coming out, they're in that two to three year window where most people apparently upgrade. And so they're anticipating iPhone 12 sales are gonna be insane because we're in an Apple super cycle. Unless you already have a phone and it breaks, in which case Apple is saying, ah, uh, replacement parts are gonna be a little short because Voldemort and his Death Eaters have shown up at the fabrication facilities that make all of the replacement parts and have eaten them up. In case you don't know what I mean by Voldemort, I can't say a certain word. So it's now Voldemort and he has eaten their supply chain. And so now Apple is saying that uh, it might take a couple weeks for them to get parts in to actually repair your iPhone if you have it needed to be repaired under warranty. Such a pity. Speaking of another product that was hit by supply chain disruption, the Valve Index has been announced by Valve to go back on sale on Monday for $1,000. Obviously, this is in hot anticipation of Half-Life Alex coming out sometime soon. And there's also some like information floating out there that the Half-Life team hopes that this isn't the last time that they're gonna be working on Half-Life, which gives people Half-Life 3, 
hopes, but it, you know what would be the greatest bamboozle? Half-Life 2, Episode 3. And then obviously we'll have to see how many of the Valve Index go back in stock, but it probably will sell out very quickly. And then let's talk about Voldemort hitting one more thing, which is South by Southwest. Amazon pulled out yesterday, and now it's been confirmed that both Netflix and Apple will be canceling their appearances at South by Southwest. According to all the other trade show scenes that I've been following, this just means that we're only a few days away from South by Southwest being canceled entirely. Even though other events like Computex and E3 are deciding that they're gonna remain strong in face of the Death Eaters, they uh, probably will also bow to the pressure to cancel as well. So South by Southwest, I'm guessing, is just a few days away from being canceled altogether. But you know what's not canceled? Castlevania. That has been officially announced to be coming out on mobile. Pick it up on iOS and Android right now. It just upsets a lot of people because it needs to be on Switch. Go get it on your phones and then yell at the company to put it on Switch because that's a perfect Switch game. And then lastly, Twitter has announced that they have fleets that you can tweet by yeeting them out into the void and then they disappear after 24 hours because they basically need to be stories on Twitter. They're calling them fleets, which is terrible name such a bad name i get it it's a pun they they're fleeting they pass after 24 hours but it just no it's bad just call them stories it's an experimental feature that's currently live only in select countries and will likely be rolling out soon to more countries to test it but i ain't eating no fully tweet not happening i saw rip twitter trending this morning just because it's like i don't think it's rip twitter but it is a pretty like i wouldn't say tone deaf but it's not a that's not why people use the platform, and I don't see people transitioning to do that. It's kind of like Instagram and IGTV. It's like, you understand what you're going for, but nobody wants this, and nobody's gonna transition over to it. Maybe some people will fleet, but at the same time, there's a reason Instagram is so popular with its stories. Snapchat is dedicated to this. There's no reason for it to be on Twitter, but maybe I'm a boomer, and I need to know What's the average number of arms that a person has? The average number of arms. Tell me down below in the comments. Also hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. Get subscribed. Don't forget that we're doing the live stream at 4 p.m. today. So check us out then. See you soon. Bye. Wow, words, mouth, work.